Hello everyone. Hope you are enjoying a festive season. The Patna Math Contest represents the end of a year-long series of math competitions. And today we'll be looking at a couple of problems from this year's Patna Contest, which was just held last week. We'll be skipping over A1, which is an analysis problem that is a bit too tedious uh, for my taste and doesn't really have a lot of interesting ideas to cover. So instead, I will leave the problem statement in the comment section below and feel free to discuss it there. Instead, we'll be covering A2, which is an algebra pro problem that is a little quirky, as well as A3, which is a number theory problem. So for A2, uh, since it's a quirky little problem, I decided to switch up my default template a little, change it to the dark mode. Let me know if you like this uh, design better. Uh, but let's take a look at the problem statement. So we have let n be an integer with n greater than or equal to 2. Among all real polynomials px of degree n, what is the largest possible number of negative coefficients of px squared? So not a sophisticated problem statement, it's very short and sharp. Uh, let's present uh, the solution in a way that leads naturally to the final answer. So to begin, I think let's remind ourselves how does the coefficients of px squared behave relative to px. So if we let px be the generic coefficient, uh, rather generic polynomial, a n x n until a0, then px squared has order 2n, uh, and 2n plus 1 coefficients, which let us call them b 2n until b0 in decreasing order of the powers. Uh, so how do we compute these coefficients in terms of the original a's? Well, uh, this is nothing too complicated, it's just a reminder. Uh, if we write out the a's here, then b to n is just uh, this times this, a n times a n. And then b to n minus 1, if you imagine out expanding the, the product in your head, is a n times a n minus 1 plus a n minus 1 times a n. Right? And this cross pattern continues. So b to n minus 2 will be uh, this times this plus this times this plus this times this. Right? And this pattern continues. Uh, eventually, we reach b n, which is... Uh, the sum of all these cross products here, and then uh, b n minus 1, you start to leave out uh, a n, right? So now you have a n minus 1 times a 0 plus this times this and this times this and so on, eventually reaching b 0 equals a 0 times a 0. So hopefully this uh, is a useful reminder. And from this, we can see that uh, very quickly b to n, which is a n squared, and b 0, which is a 0 squared, definitely cannot be negative. So from the beginning, we know two of the coefficients are definitely out. Can we be greedy and require all the other coefficients to be negative? This is a natural question to uh, ponder, right? And let's see what it takes for all the other coefficients to be negative. So let's start off uh, assuming without loss of generality that a n is a positive uh, number. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I assume positive or negative because uh, I can just flip all the signs in the uh, the argument uh, and it will still apply. So let's assume uh, without loss of generality that a is positive. Now, if we want b to n minus 1 to be negative, what does it take? Uh, since b to n minus 1 is this product plus this product, we see that in order for b to n minus 1 to be negative, the only hope is for a n minus 1 to also be a negative number. So, okay, we force a n minus 1 to be negative. And how about b 2n minus 2 after that? If we want it to be negative, then let's see. Uh, the product terms that are in the middle that doesn't involve a n minus 2 uh, is already predetermined as negative times negative, which is positive. So we have uh, some positive term, and then the remaining terms in the sum is uh, a n times a n minus 2, right? And we want uh, b 2n minus 2 to be negative, so the only hope for this is if a n minus 2 is negative and sufficiently large enough, uh, sufficiently negative enough, so that uh, these terms cancel out the positive contribution from a n minus 1 times a n minus 1. Uh, we don't care about magnitude at this point. All I, the only conclusion I need is a n minus 2 is forced to be negative if we want b 2n minus 2 to be negative. Uh, so make sure you understand this logic because this logic applies all the way, uh, and let's just check b n to be, to be sane, right? Okay, so let's say we already show all these terms are negative. 
uh, and now we haven't determined A0 yet. Um, how do we force A0 to be negative? Well, uh, what does it take for Bn to be negative? So among all the terms that are already determined in the middle, uh, so An minus 1 times A1, uh, that is negative and negative, so it's positive. Then An minus 2 times A2 is negative and negative, so it's positive, and so on. So Bn is the sum of all these products of which all the determined uh, ones are positives. Uh, so in order for Bn to be negative, we need An times A0 to be negative and sufficiently negative enough. But I don't care about magnitude at this point. All I, the only conclusion I need is, therefore, A0 must be negative. So we can now see that this is a problem because now uh, we have Bn minus 1 to B1, they are forced to be positive. Because Bn minus 1, for example, is the product of all these cross terms, which are negative to negative equals positive. Uh, sim the simplest to see is B1, for example, is A1 times A0 plus A0 times A1, which is a uh, sum of two positive things. So it is definitely impossible for all coefficients to be negative. Uh, along the way, we are forced to reach this conclusion about the signs, and well, it just doesn't work out. So uh, 2n minus 1 as the answer is impossible. How about 2n minus 2? Which means uh, b2 and b0 as well as one more term we are allowed to be negative. Uh, I mean we are allowed to be uh, po positive. So here's a construction that makes everything negative except b2n, bn, and b0. Okay, so I'm just going to put up uh, some signs here. I'll explain what it means, but you notice that the signs get bigger and bigger and the magnitude now plays a role in this construction. So uh, let's see how this construction works. Okay, so B to N we know is definitely positive, so uh, let's not care about that. Uh, but again, uh, for the purpose of construction, I'm going to start off with A N being positive. And then A N minus 1, as long as I make it a negative number, then B to N is the sum of two negative terms, so fine, it's negative. Now A N minus 2, for it to be negative, uh, similar to the previous logic, we just need an minus 2 to be negative, and we need it to be sufficiently uh, large in terms of uh, the magnitudes, so that this negative term and this negative term will outweigh this positive term. Right, so just pick something that is large enough, and then continue this pattern. So an minus 3, just pick it sufficiently like large to make the term negative and so on, until like let's say a1, uh, just as a sanity check to make sure you understand what's happening, uh, we just uh, all the terms here that have been predetermined, they are like positive uh, products. Uh, so in order for Bn plus 1 to be negative, we just need A1 to be negative and largely negative enough so that it cancels out all the positive terms. Uh, so that's why the signs get bigger and bigger. We need A1 to be sufficiently largely negative, right? And then now we reach the a0 point. Remember in the contradiction uh, slide, a0 was forced to be negative. But that's, this time that's not the case because we already said up front that we give up on bn. bn will not be negative. So we can, uh, there's no constraint on a0 yet. But what we're going to do is we are going to make uh, a0 insanely big uh, and positive. And that will help us make bn minus 1 to b1 negative. Uh, why is that? So for example, Bn minus 1 is the product of all these uh, uh, terms that you uh, that my cursor is trying to illustrate. So the, the products here that involve the middle part, part uh, work out to be positive terms. So if we make An minus 1 times A0 sufficiently largely negative, it will again cancel all the positive terms, right? So uh, that's why if we make A0 insanely big enough, that will work. So the conclusion is that uh, this construction will be able to give us uh, 2n minus 2 negative coefficients. And since we shown in the earlier slide that 2n minus 1 is impossible, the answer is 2n minus 2. So quite a quirky little algebra pro problem. Uh, I wouldn't say it's too difficult to come up with the solution in the sense that if we consider a natural question of whether we can make everything negative, uh, it will lead us down the line of uh, logic that leads to this solution. So good problem nonetheless. I enjoyed uh, working on this problem. Okay, 
Let's take a look at A3, which is a number theory problem. So stay tuned for this problem because you will realize how surprising uh, the, this, this problem actually is. So let P be a prime number greater than 5. Let FP denote the number of infinite sequences A1, A2, A3 and so on, such that A, uh, AN uh, draws from 1, 2 and dear P minus 1. Okay, so, so basically it's, uh, uh, within 1 to P minus 1. And the sequence satisfy AN, AN plus 2, congruent to 1 plus AN plus 1, mod P, uh, for all N greater than or equal to 1. Prove that, uh, FP, which is the number of possible such sequences, is congruent to 0 or 2 mod 5. So at first, when you look at this problem, it looks like extremely convoluted and you have no idea what's happening. So let's try and, uh, simplify the problem a bit, what it's saying. So firstly, we have the rule, the, the sequence rule, right? So actually the sequence rule looks a bit convoluted, but I can simply divide uh, AN across. So what I'm saying is AN plus 2 in terms of mod P, when we are working strictly in mod P, which means uh, 0 to P minus 1, right? Uh, AN plus 2 is given by 1 plus uh, AN plus 1 divided by AN. And divided here means just multiply by the modular inverse. And we can do this so long as the sequence keeps staying uh, in 1, 2, until P minus 1 under mod P, right? Any non-zero uh, remainder in, a, in mod prime has a multiplication inverse. So now when you look at this, it's a deterministic rule. Like you have this uh, AN, you have AN plus 1, you can calculate AN plus 2 as a fixed option. So that really simplifies the problem in your head. So Basically, now we know that as long as we pick A1 and A2, the whole sequence is determined. A3 is false, A4 is false, then A5 is false, and so on. And this will be a valid infinite sequence as long as we never hit 0 mod P because we can always find the modular inverse, compute this, and then get the next term. So it becomes how many valid A1 and A2 you can pick such that you never hit 0 mod P. Okay, uh, the natural thing is I mean, let's work out the first few terms and see what happens. So you have A1, let's say you pick X and A2 you pick Y. Then the the rest of uh, these terms are just aromatic. Now A3 is uh, A2 plus 1 over A1, right? So it's this. Then just work through the aromatic. A4 is this, A5 is this. Then you realize A6 is X again, A7 is Y. So it turns out that AN basically is of period 5. And these are the terms. Uh, and so as long as you pick x and y such that x is not 0, y is not 0, y plus 1 is not 0, x plus y plus 1 is not 0, and x plus 1 is not 0, which are the five conditions here, then you will get a valid sequence. And I mean, it's quite easy to count the number of such uh, options. So uh, over here, I have uh, x and y. So we band x equals 0 and y equals 0, x p minus 1 and y p minus 1. And then x plus 1 not equals to uh, minus 1 is basically the diagonal here. So we have uh, the white square in the middle is of dimension p minus 2 by p minus 2. And then you minus the diagonal, which is p minus 2 terms. So the number of valid sequences is p minus 2 square minus p minus 2, which is p minus 2 times p minus 3. And you can just directly check that uh, under mod 5, this is congruent to 0 or 2 among all options. Uh, Remember, p is bigger than 5, so basically p is congruent 1, 2, 3, or 4, mod 5, and you just brute force and see it's either 0 or 2. So, uh, yeah, that's really all to this problem. So the reason why I say A3 is like, bruh, it's because like, like literally you just like write out the first five sequence, uh, first five, uh, terms, and then you realize it repeats in period of five, yeah, like, bruh, uh, that's, that's all to this problem. Yeah, so, uh, very interesting. Normally A3 is like, quite a step up in difficulty, but this year uh, is a bit of a uh, quirky uh, A2 and quirky A3, I must say. Yeah, so uh, that's all we will cover in this video. I uh, see some interesting problems coming up for the rest of A and as well in, uh, in session B, so I'll cover more problems in the coming weeks.